Uh-oh, here we are. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Shushak, and I feel like I really, truly do need to introduce myself to you now. It's been four weeks since I've been with you, at least in this position, and so I am even more grateful than usual to be the pastor here at Edges. I've been on a preaching sabbatical for the month of June, and I need to begin this morning by just saying an enormous thank you to those of you who made it possible and especially those of you who are part of the Theo team. I don't know, especially if today is your first time, you may not know that we have a team. We call it Theo. It's short for theology. And this is a team of folks who meet weekly with me to partner in sermon preparation. And that's because this team is one of our teams that has a special conviction. And their conviction is that a sermon should just simply be how you curate a conversation in community about and with God. So this team lives by that principle, and when you think about it, imagine how many different ways that could be done. So if you're stuck with me every week, you're going to get the way that I think about that. But because we have this team of eight folks, uh, those ways are enlarged and expanded in this community. So this past year, David and Sarah and Preston and Justice, and Francis, and Kylie, and Cassidy, many of those who you heard over this past month, they've helped enlarge our experiences of God by offering their particular lives toward this task week in and week out. No matter who you see standing in this position each week, there are another eight people behind that that have helped to discern and pray and sometimes argue (laughs) over how it gets to this spot. So I know that we as a community are wider and deeper for that, And I'm just genuinely grateful. And now for the month of July, we're going to try something I've never done in 20 years of ministry. Together, we're going to revisit some ideas that have been preached here before. Our hope as a Theo team is that these sermons will be some that some of us remember and need to revisit again. And that no matter what happens, we'll be able to experience some of those ideas together in a new way. And whether you remember hearing the sermon or not the first time, you probably won't because it's taken a new shape. Our biggest aspiration is that we have chosen some ideas that God will show up in now again for this community. So in order to prepare for this series, and because it was already on my calendar, (laughs) I went away for a few days with Frank to our favorite place. It's in the middle of nowhere. That's why I'm not telling you where it is, because if I tell you where it is, it won't be in the middle of nowhere anymore. You will all go and find it. This place has no Wi-Fi. It has no cell service. It seriously only has an old-fashioned landline, like a real phone. There are no stores here. There are very few people here, and there is just one little general store, like an old-fashioned general store from the Waltons or something is what it has. So this whole town feels like it's wearing noise-canceling headphones. There's almost nothing. So it's probably because I was there that I picked this first sermon for the series. I first preached a version of this sermon in the year 2015 in a series that we called Pause. And that sermon began with a story that I had read in the Smithsonian Magazine that February. The article that I read showed a map that had been compiled by researchers at the National Park Service. The map depicts just how difficult it's gotten to secure a slice of silence. You can see the map on the screen. You may be able to tell that this map consists of data collected over 1.5 million hours of acoustic monitoring. No, you can't tell that by looking at the map, right? What I want to tell you about this map is that it was... It it has data that they collected from 1.5 million hours of acoustic monitoring all over the country. And as you can see on the map, the high background noise levels are in yellow, and the low background noise levels are in blue. Now look where we live. But there is one little blue patch, and that's where Frank and I go, see? So you can see we are in the upper end of acoustic noise levels right here where we live. 
Well, the scientists from this study are warning that we know that all of the noise isn't healthy. Even instinctively, we know that. And because of that, we want out of all of this forced input, all of the noise that's constantly coming at us. But what they argue is that all of our efforts to avoid sound might be actually allowing the noise pollution to get worse. Think about it for a moment. What do we do when we want to drown things out? We add in more noise. So they say that what we're doing could cause a phenomenon that they're calling learned deafness. They say that to control the sounds in our personal worlds, we might resort, for instance, to wearing headphones that blare our favorite music in our ears. So we add to the noise pollution that there already is, even more noise pollution to drown out the sounds we think we don't want to hear. Or they say we could just close our ears off and ignore the auditory stimuli of the world that's around us. Something else that some of us may do. We seek to find quieter spaces. Well, Kurt Fistrup, who was one of the um, researchers in this study, he's a senior scientist at the U.S. National Park Service, said that this learned deafness is a real issue. Because, he says, we are conditioning ourselves to ignore the information that's coming into our ears. And then he said this, there's a real danger, both a loss of auditory acuity, where we are exposed to noise for so long that we stop listening, but also there's a loss of our listening habits, where we lose the ability to engage the environment the way we were built. So I found that fascinating that we could actually condition our bodies to do something that would have a more negative impact while trying to have a positive one. So Fistrup compared this problem to the effect that fog might have on how you perceive a landscape, where you only see what's a a small portion of what's actually in front of you. Even in our cities where there are birds singing or things to appreciate in the environment, There can be really rich natural choruses to pay attention to, and he says we're missing almost all of them. So it made me think about what really is being lost if we've conditioned ourselves not to listen. The article made me wonder about our ability to hear the kinds of things that God is saying to us in the world. What are the kinds of things God is saying always that we may be missing. If we've lost our capacity to engage with the environment, if we've really stopped forming good listening habits, how then will we hear anything that God wants to say either? So I thought about some of my remedies, some of the ways that I seek to cancel out the noise that's in my world. And I don't only just mean the auditory noise, I mean metaphorically all of the stirred upness that's in my life. My favorite remedy, my favorite way to be still, to cancel out the noise in my life is to fall asleep to Shark Tank. (laughs) That's one of the ways I practice learned deafness. So I think it's a good question to ask out loud this morning. What are some of the ways that we actually help learn deafness? Just think about your life for a moment. How do you cancel out all your noise? Call out a few fun things. What do you do to cancel out the noise in your world? You, <laughs> Michael watches Bob Ross paint. <laughs> okay. Good. Hike. Sorry? Hike. Hike. Good. Sleep? Yeah, a lot of us choose sleep. This side, do y'all do anything? Or are you doing it right now? <laughs> <laughs> Social media, okay? AirPods with music all day. Yeah. And now if you have long hair, nobody even knows you're doing it. Stay off social media to cancel that noise. Meditate, okay? Bake. Eat. 
So a question is to decide, are those helping us or harming us? Can some of those be both directions? Somewhere after reading this study, I remembered that the Bible has lots to say about how we can listen to God, how we could actively listen to God. I would suggest to you that it could be in any of those things you've just said and that it might also not be. One of the most famous verses that people like to quote on this topic comes from the Psalms, and there's a psalm that says simply, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. So I have always thought that the command in this verse is to find some way to get rid of all that noise and to be still, like to go to the place where Frank and I go. To go away from the noise to a place where all you have is a landline where nobody has the number. (laughs) This is the way you do it. And that if we could ever really choose that, if we could choose stillness or silence, even Sabbath is a word we sometimes use, especially instead of creating even more background noise with some of those remedies you said that can be toxic and that cause learned deafness, if we could do it in a way that's helpful, then what if we really could know God? So I looked up those be still verses with a mind that I would preach a hellfire sermon and now that I would preach it twice about how simply we have to find ways to get out of the rat race if we wish to know God. That would be the remedy. But when I opened Psalm 46, and I think this is why I came back to it again this past week, when I opened Psalm 46, when I really placed myself in the shoes of that writer, and when I read the whole context around that be still injunction, I found something totally different. The writer's story begins with a summary statement in Psalm chapter 46. The first verse says this, God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. A help always near in the middle of the rat race. I imagine the author getting up at the beginning of the day, and I imagine the author telling himself this truth, the first thing he does when he wakes up, God will be with me in this time of trouble. It sounds to me like he wakes up to the kind of day where the alarm goes off and the panic starts all over again in his spirit, almost even before he opens his eyes. You've had those days, right? So he starts that way. He remembers that God is always close by, even in the middle of the rat race, even where the noise is loud, ready to give help and safety and strength. That's what the text says. In the middle of the rat race, in the middle of the trouble, God will give you help and strength and safety if you can hear it. Then the writer begins to journal about his own life. He talks about his troubles, about how it seems his world is unraveling before his eyes, and about how instability and chaos are the shape of it all. Have you ever had those days? So after saying, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. The earth is changing, the mountains are shaking in the heart of the seas, the waters roar and they foam. The mountains tremble with its tumult. Metaphors for a world going crazy. Then about halfway through his journal reflection, you get the feeling that in the middle of all that chaos, the writer goes up to the balcony of his own life. This is a strategy. And he looks down, and he can make out an image in the fog, and he sees that it's God right in the middle of his tumultuous life, coming to help, being a place of safety. So he says in verse 4, Oh, wait, I look down and I see there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. He sees God living in the middle of his world. Then verse 5, God is in the midst of the city and it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. He has hope. That God is going to help his mess. And then while he's looking in on his real life, he hears God speak. Because in the middle of the chaos, he found a moment and a way to be still. 
So from the middle of the chaos, he hears God speak, and it says that the earth melts at God's words. Things begin to change. The things he thought were immovable begin to melt and change, which in my opinion would be terrifying. (laughs) But because this guy is really listening and now he's seeing a bigger picture, he's not afraid that life as he knows it is oozing all over the table. He knows it's going to melt towards something that God's going to do. So he's able to trust that God is the real thing you have to hang on to anyway, that God is the thing you want not to move, not all the stuff in your world. And this all seems to remind him of the other times that God has been in the very thick of his experience. And so he begins to tick them off in his journal. Verse 6, well, the nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms, they totter. But he, that is God, utters his voice, and the earth melts. So you just think for a moment about whether you have ever believed that when your kingdoms have been in an uproar, when they totter. Do you believe that God can speak? You can hear it. And things begin to take a new shape. He does because in verse 7 he says, The Lord of hosts really is with us. We really do have a God of Jacob that is our refuge, a safe place. Even where everything is not safe, we found a safe place. So then he tells his story, Come, behold the works of the Lord. Look and see what God's done. See what desolations he has brought on the earth, on the chaos. See how God has made desolate the chaos. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, and he burns the shields with fire. He has confidence that God is going to change things. So finally, this writer is about to close his journal and go get in the shower. And he is so sure of the validity and the perspective that he's just gotten through this little reflective exercise that he quotes God. He hears God in the middle of it all. And he hears God say, in quotes, be still and know that I am God. If you'll be still, you will know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I'm the biggest thing. Your trouble is not the biggest thing. I am exalted in the earth. So, this past week, here's a little new freedom that I found in the passage. Number one, this guy found God in the noise of his life. So that helps me know that what matters is whether we can just go up to the balcony of our own frenzy and hear God from that place. Not go find a quiet place always, because sometimes that's not possible. I'm looking at you. You are so exhausted, (laughs) some of you you got to find a way to do it in the middle of the frenzy. And number two, for those of us who aren't sure if there is a God, I wonder if Psalm 46 could be a comfort for that. When we are not sure if there is a God, what if stillness will hold an answer? Because the text says, if you'll be still, you'll know that there is a God. Be still and know that I am God. What if stillness holds an answer for those of us who aren't always sure? And number three, when we're still, what if that would help us to remember that we don't have to be God? Be still and know that I am God and that I am not God. What if in stillness I can remember that I don't have to always be the source of my own help? I don't have to always save myself or the people around me. That rescue can come from some place that I don't engineer. So, how do we find out? How do we be still so that we can find out? Today I want to suggest just one possibility, then I'm going to ask you to think of a few. It's one of probably a million ways that God could use to tell us what we most need to hear. It's just one suggestion. It's an idea that I read about some time ago in a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Some, uh, it, it's a book that uh, resonates with a lot of you from time to time. People will say, have you read Mere Christianity? And I tell you, it's so dense. 
I, I vote you find some good quotes from the book. That's what I think. <laughs> but it's powerful if, you can, if you're smart enough to get through it, which I guess some of us could be together. That's what I'm actually going to vote for, that we read it together sometime. Meanwhile, here's one excellent quote from the book. So C.S. Lewis is reflecting about how difficult it is to be still. And he writes this. The real problem begins where people do not usually look for it. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and your hopes and your worries and your fears, all the action items for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning, here's the be still part. The first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, in taking the other point of view, in letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, and so on all day. Standing back from all your natural fussings and frettings, coming in out of the wind. So as you can see, Lewis suggests that the first thing each morning is that we practice shoving back all the wild animals, all the hopes and worries and fears and wishes, all the action items, that the very first thing is more like what the writer of the psalm does. Only C.S. Lewis doesn't tell us how to do it in several hundred pages of mere Christianity. So I think maybe that's because that's one part you and I will have to build our own structures for. Maybe that's the part God trusts us with. So, what could you do if you wanted to practice Psalm 46? How would you do the first moments of each morning differently if you wanted to be still and see if you could know God? So, I have a question for you before I tell you what's one way that I do it. What are two, think about two realistic ideas that you have for how you could begin a day like Lewis suggests pushing back the wild animals so that another voice could get in. Practically, how could you begin a day? I'm going to give you just a few seconds to think about that, and then I'm going to ask us to talk about it with a few other folks. Sometimes we get in groups to talk about things because it allows us to think things that we wouldn't have thought by ourselves, especially not from just hearing one person speak. So that's the question for the morning. And the way it works at Edges is we ask you to get in a group of five or six folks. Try, really do try to get with somebody that you don't know in your group. So if you're in a family of five, it might help for some of you to split up and go two directions. But here's the thing. Not everybody has to talk, and some people are more comfortable listening. So just get in a group that's big enough that somebody's going to talk. And if you'll just introduce yourselves to each other, that's also a way that sometimes people can help continue the conversation after this particular worship conversation is over. It'll be pretty easy, I promise. And there are lots of folks in the room who've done this lots of times, so try to get with somebody who looks like they've done it before. Ready? I'm going to give you about four minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Go.
Okay, that really was four minutes. Okay. So the question was, what are two realistic ideas you have for how you could begin a day like Lewis suggests? By pushing back the wild animals so that another voice, so that God's voice could begin to speak to you. I'll just ask you if you heard one idea that you think is worth mentioning as a possibility for the group. Sometimes we want to do this stuff, but we just think, gosh, I don't even know how it would begin. Did you hear one idea that you think is worth mentioning out loud? In about this size of an answer. Okay, so she said that their group mentioned that we spend a lot of time rushing. So if you can just take a moment and think or be present without thinking first about what you have to do, then perhaps that could be a way to trip the switch. Okay, so some people said that, um, that, especially for people with little kids, there really is no morning. That's not what she said. <laughs> that that can be the most difficult time. So you could shift it to another point in the day. Sure. What else? So sometimes before being able to do anything positive, it takes a no first. A no, I'm not going to do this thing or engage in that thing. No. It takes starting from that spot. Sure. This side was feeling inferior last time with the responses apparently. So you guys got anything over here today? Yeah, see, you could have missed that if I didn't hold out. Drinking coffee on the deck and watching the birds can be a way. Sure. A run or a sunrise hike can be a possibility. Yeah, without sort of legalism, I mean, clearly not everybody can do all of these things every single day, but what if just one of the days we could start differently as a first practice? One more? Right. The idea that even a small snippet of time, sometimes even a forced snippet, like if you have to drive to work every day, how could that time be reinvented or reimagined to be a way for something? So here's why I picked this sermon to revisit. In 2015, I told you that I was practicing a different start, and I began it that week, which means I've been doing it for four years now. It's a simple prayer that's on my home screen of my computer because my computer is one of the very first things that I usually open. So it's a way of reimagining that opening moment um, on my computer. And I'm just going to show you this prayer that I've been praying for four years and tell you a little bit about why. The prayer begins, God, my friend, I offer you this day. Instead of what am I going to take from it, I just want to offer it to you for whatever it could be that I haven't even imagined yet. Would you let all my prayer and all my work and every joyous thing and even all my suffering be offered together with the other lives offered to you by the whole people of God? So what that little phrase says to me is, let the stuff I'm doing join with the stuff you're already doing with other people. So whatever I'm praying for, help it link up to the prayers other people are praying. Let me suffer together with other people who are already suffering so it's not so hard for us to hold it together. So I'm going to be joyful. Let that carry to somebody else. It's a way of asking God to combine my moments with other people's moments. And then the final paragraph changes every day. Let your spirit be with me today, especially in. 
That's where I just talk to God about now the stuff that comes rushing in. I got this stuff, God. Would you help me? Would you let it not just be me that's in control of it? And then I pray, I ask your love and concern for my friend. And that's where I just spend my time talking to God about you or about my family, about the people who are in my sphere. It changed when I was in the Dominican Republic and when I was out there in the woods with Frank, when I was with our family last week. It, the, the people that I have concern for change every day. And then finally, remind me today that I'm not alone. Just remind me that I'm not doing this life by myself. And I want you to know that I believe I hear God more now than I did four years ago. I believe I've been able to make some huge different choices because of the perspective that I've been given. Because I could be a little bit still sometimes and know that God is real. Now I've only done this about 20% of the time in four years, but I'm looking forward to 30% being next year, you know? It's begun to shift a habit inside of me. It's not perfect yet. It never will be. But it has been a way to practice Psalm 46 in my life. To let some of the stuff that would rush in naturally not have the control. So I don't know if any of us will have the courage to try anything new this week or in the coming months. But I want to tell you what C.S. Lewis says will happen and you see whether you think it's true. He says, what I've learned in the last four years, we can only do it for moments at first. But from those moments, the new sort of life will be spreading through our system. Because now we are letting God work at the right part of us. It's the difference between paint, he says, which is merely laid on the surface, and a dye or a stain that will soak all the way through. If we don't find a way to be still, I believe our spirits will go through life wearing noise-canceling headphones. I think that's what the scripture is asking us to avoid. It sounds to me like finding a way into the noise and in that noise, finding a way to be still will help us to find out who God is and to become who we really are. So let it be. Amen.